put a defense, but unfortunately, it's just not adding up. The puzzles aren't fitting. Um, I do believe that the prosecution does have a strong case here. And so far, I feel, you know, they're, they're definitely meeting their burden. And um, we'll have to see how things play out. I know at the, at the moment, they're discussing whether or not portions of the actual interrogation video should be included in as evidence. Um, and so just from viewing pieces of it today, uh, the judge is actually re was reviewing it. Uh, parts of the interrogation video was actually, uh, one piece was the defendant himself admitting that the, his uh, neighbor knew exactly where the bodies were disposed of in some sort of pit. And apparently during this interrogation video, when he changes his mind, he asks for a bathroom break. I believe it's the second or third bathroom break. And that's when he goes to the bathroom, locks himself inside. And so you have, um, you have some sort of an attempted suicide. We're not sure exactly whether that's the case or not. But these are what the prosecution the prosecution and the defense right now are arguing before the court and we believe that uh, this will be admitted in, into evidence for the jury to decide to help them in, in making their decision. Yeah, I mean, a lot of back and forth over the last 24 hours in this case, basically. Around this time yesterday, we were listening to the defense claim that this uh, legal concept known as a corpus delecti, which uh, translates from Latin to English to mean the body of evidence. It doesn't literally mean the body of the victim. It means the body of evidence needs to point the, uh, to a, a presumption that a crime was occurred before someone can be tried for that crime. Uh, usually, it's pretty clear cut. There's a body. It has wounds, it's been murdered, something criminal happened. It's a question of who did it. And the state tries to make a point that it's the defendant, of course. That's the way it normally goes in most of the cases that we see. Now, in this one, the defense has used that over and over again to turn around and say, hey, wait a minute, if you can't prove that there was a crime committed, because uh, the defense would have us believe, at least in some arguing, in some argument, uh, that these people may be missing, it's a pretty strong may, but that's what they would have us believe in at least some of their arguments and turn around and say, hey, um, you know, state of Florida, you need to prove that a crime was committed before you can play the defendant's confession for killing the wife because he apparently confessed. Now, uh, it'll be interesting to see exactly how he confessed because I have not yet heard that clip, uh, but they claim that it amounts to a confession. And yet we know that people confess to crimes they haven't committed all the time. We hear it here on Law News. We hear it from prison inmates who uh, claim to have confessed to things that happened when they were incarcerated so they couldn't have committed the crime. Um, you know, and, and we have plenty of, uh, we have mountains of evidence about that possibly happening. So, uh, look, this guy was being interrogated. One of his interrogations was more than 10 hours long. Okay, he was interrogated, I think I counted seven times within two weeks after uh, this uh, crime was alleged to have occurred. Uh, is it possible uh, that maybe he did confess just to get the interrogation over with? Now, I'll answer my own question, I guess, and say that I don't think so, but uh, it, it would seem that that's where the defense was going with the arguments yesterday to try to keep these interrogations out. Right, and so, you know, one of the questions that you have when you have the interrogating officers, you ask them, what was the environment? How was the environment? Did you provide water breaks when they needed to go to the restroom? Did you allow them to go to the restroom? You know, in, in cases where I've seen personally, you know, these are the, the questions that we look at and the answers that we look at. Was there actual a video interrogation? Was there a transcript to prove that police procedures were followed? So you can't say, well, this was coerced. You know, this interrogation was completely coerced. They were, you know, they were giving me my water breaks. They, you know, they were shoving my head onto the table and basically saying, you tell me or else. You know, that does happen. I also agree with you. I don't think in this situation this occurred. Um, the, in, the initial interrogating officer came. He talked about the proper uh, police procedures. He 
he explained the environment that he was in. And when I watched pieces of the interrogation myself, the defendant himself looked pretty relaxed as opposed to some other defendants where you could feel, you know, the tension that's in the room and you have surrounding intimidating officers that are just sitting there looking at that person. Um, I didn't get that vibe in this situation. And so I could see how that's important. And of course the defense would like to make that argument, but you know, you need to have the proof in the pudding and that's why transcript reading is so important for a criminal defense attorney. We always take a look at the transcripts of the interrogation, look at the time, when was the start time, when was the end time, just to ensure that procedures were followed. In this particular situation, when he needed a water break, he was provided one, and each time he asked to go to the restroom, they allowed that to happen. And it was interesting because he was asking for the restroom breaks very close to one another. Um, but police uh, seemed like they were compliant with that and they were okay. So yeah, I, and, I and, see that as an issue. And that leads us to the next issue because so they tried to keep the bulk of these recordings out yesterday. Well, that didn't work. The judge said, hey, look, there's enough evidence for a jury to believe that a crime was committed here, even though we don't have um, a literal body in front of us here. You can just add the rest of the evidence up. And I think the state did a good job of pointing out exactly uh, why it's improbable that these people just didn't vanish into thin air. Uh, you know, right. she disappears, the kids disappear, they don't go to her mother's, which is why the mother said they would have come here if they were in uh, serious harm, they needed to flee, okay? Uh, all of their personal property was still in the house. Uh, the house had been uh, doused, cleaned with pine saw, and it reeked when the investigators showed up the next morning. There's and uh, you've got the blood, you've got the blood on the boots, you've got the blood in the car mat, and you have the defendant changing his story. The bank accounts, the cell phone, the purse, all of this uh, are still there. It, it does not look like this mother took off with the kids to hide out somewhere. Uh, she would have taken money out of the account. She would have taken a purse. She would have taken her car probably. So um, I think that was a good call. Now then this morning, they sort of shift the gears and, and say, well, let's try to keep out this part of uh, the defendant's interrogation that where he basically apparently attempted to commit suicide in the bathroom. They want that out. And it was at a critical point in the interrogation as we were talking about a couple of minutes ago. Right, and so the important part here for the judge to decide was the act, which was the suicide, and the connection that it had, the nexus that it had to the conscious of guilt. And so the judge said it himself. He's like, look, at first the defendant was completely in denial of everything. Then he comes back for his other interrogation and he comes says, well, I actually, I confessed to the murder of my wife, but my kids, they were murdered by my neighbor, Mr. Jackson, I believe his name was. And then he, he says something about a tar pit and then he comes back and then he says, um, he says, I believe that they're in some pit, but I'll never give that information to you and then asks for the bathroom break and then goes to the bathroom and that's when this alleged incident of the suicide takes place and the judge says, look, he's giving incriminating statements, complete conscious of guilt. He goes from denying to now admitting to now talking about possibly where the bodies can be found. He wants to kill himself. <laughs> he doesn't want to get prosecuted. He wants to avoid any type of liability here. And so, you know, just backtracking, the defense was like, well, there's no bodies, so, you know, you can't prosecute. Well, just because you dispose of bodies doesn't mean that a crime wasn't committed. And, uh, you know, it goes back again, well, with the not only the overwhelming evidence prior to, you know, the day before, following her, the lover, the incident that happened at work, um, you know, and the mother testifying and saying they had issues. Apparently, this this is not a new thing. They've had issues, and she felt like he wasn't really a partner. I think that she was pretty much taking a lot of the heavy lifting in the family as far as providing for the family. Uh, he was either a barber or trying to become a barber. Well, he, but he was he was a barber. She was working full time, um, you know, while she was going to school. She was just about to get her degree. So, again, why would she disappear 
if right. she's a, about to receive her diploma within a couple of months. And right. you know, she's working her tail off, and uh, you know, he's also going to school to be the barber. So um, apparently she was kind of supporting him. And uh, it, look, it just doesn't make for a good situation, bottom line. Yeah. And, and, and we are where we are. I want to play a clip here because we do have the 911 recording. This is when the defendant showed up where his wife worked to confront her about this affair that the husband had discovered. And apparently you can hear the husband flipping out in the background of this call. It's a coworker making the call. Let's listen to that. We'll be back in a second. Um, yes, I was wondering if I could have a police officer come to an office building. We have somebody in our building that will not leave and he's not an employee. And apparently he Have you asked him to leave yet? Yeah, we have. What's the address? It is 735 Primera Boulevard. What's the he's right down the hall. Okay, you mean say it's a male? Yes, it is. Okay, so that's like Hispanic. Hispanic. What is he wearing? I'm sorry? What is he wearing? Uh, a black outfit. And there is, I hear some disturbance in the background. I'm sorry, I can't hear you because they're having confrontation in front of me now. Okay, give me one second. Okay, let me just touch the floor, okay? All right, I appreciate it. Stay on the line, okay? Stay on the line, you said? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted your job to know how you go ahead and go a couple of tricks and go around with over. And I got some messages to show you, Bobby. I got some messages to show you. out in hives. And we have secured doors, and it looks like he's leaving now. Okay, which way is he leaving? Um, it looks like he went towards the left, but you can only turn uh, right on to Primera. Uh, yeah, right on to Primera, so I don't know if he's going to loop around. It, it looks like it's a domestic abuse. Okay, what? Oh, the guy is, I'd be very careful. Okay. What's your name and phone number? Okay. All right, and like I said, it looked like he did take off, and it looked like a silver Saturn. I don't know. His wife is here, so she could probably give you more information. Okay, no problem. Okay. Thank you. All right. So that was the phone call uh, where a coworker called 911 and said, hey, the defendant is here, and uh, he's raising a, a scene in front of us. So that's where he was, uh, at least in part of it, confronting the lover whose testimony we were just reviewing and saying, hey, look, I've got some text messages to show you. At one point I heard him say, you know, this is wrong. Uh, Orly, you can tell he's agitated, uh, but to hear it go down, just uh, and knowing what's been alleged since that happened just uh, makes you cringe all the more. Yeah, and, and then for him to say, well, I don't know what happened to her. What do you mean? You know, I, I, you know, and and there's no body. There's nothing going on here. Well, you know, everybody saw kind of what it. It was just a story. You know, th this is like a movie unfolding just in front of your eyes, unfortunately, and it just happened. You know, he he comes in, he storms in. Um, he's obviously confronting her. He's upset. He's crazed. You know, this is exactly why. They're charging him with second degree as opposed to first degree in the situation because, um, you know, they're saying that it wasn't premeditated. 
Uh, but, you know, in, in this situation, you have all these events just warming up right to when when it happens and that evening. And, uh, and unfortunately, we have three people who are missing and we have all the evidence pointing in one direction. You know, in that clip, we hear her uh, basically begging him to leave, saying she's sorry. And I have to wonder, you know, at what point do we turn around and say one killing is premeditated and one isn't? So if he shows up at her workplace, confronts her, he's installed this spyware on her phone, he's getting more and more charged up, uh, you know, he admits to karate chopping her neck, um, you know, are they trying to say that, look, he didn't mean to kill her by doing that, that she died accidentally as a result of something that he did to her? Um, but there's just such a the only, there's such a train of, of trouble going down the tracks here and it doesn't stop. There is and it does look planned. It does look planned. He's telling her, Listen, you have a bug in your phone. This is why I need to install this app. You know, that's how he gets to install the app. He's obviously thought this out. You know, this is not a situation where husband comes home and catches his wife in bed with another guy and then just goes berserk, right? You know, and so we always talk about that's, you know, that's a heat of passion type of defense, which, you know, you'll still face manslaughter charges. But I think that's how they were trying to seek this as far as saying between first and second, you know, but in this situation, I still see this as planned, even myself as a criminal defense attorney, because he he had suspicions that she was having an affair. You know, he placed this application. He found out, you know, she's who the guy was. You know, was her coworker. Uh, you know, they were having all these financial struggles aside from this affair going on, and he just went ballistic. He comes in there and goes ballistic out of her workplace. Uh, and so it, it's just all the evidence is there. And like we said, the, the DNA. So going back to where uh, the defense saying, well, corpus delecti, the body's not here. You can't benefit from the fact that you, you know, got rid of the body and now is saying, well, there's no crime. Um, and, and, and it goes back to the situation of, well, their story really doesn't make sense. The uh, the wife's mother in this case testified. She said, look, when they had troubles or when she had to go somewhere, the kids were with me. I took care of the kids. It seemed like the mother was very involved in their lives when needed be. She knew enough to know what was going on. And she definitely laid the foundation that there was issues between them. And what more than to see an outrage like that in her place of work? Exactly. Uh, and so you have this scene. He takes off before the police are able to show up. Uh, one of the local cops who's digging into things on the 22nd says, hey, there might be enough to arrest him. They don't. I'm not sure the intricacies of when they can actually stop someone in Florida. I know in some states when there's a report of domestic violence, they have to take someone into protective uh, custody to protect the situation, uh, regardless of whether the complainant says, oh, everything's fine now. Uh, right. I know that that's the case in at least one state where I've lived because I remember covering cases as a journalist that operated that way. In in Florida, apparently that wasn't the uh, the way that this rolled out. So uh, one has to wonder, you know, what what if that had uh, happened? Uh, would would she sure. still be here? Would the children still be here? Uh, you know, what if you know the neighbor who heard uh, a woman screaming for help? overnight between the 22nd and 23rd actually been able to discover the source of uh, that that plea. The neighbor looked around outside, thought it was coming from outside, didn't see anybody, thought maybe it was kids messing around, thought all was well, went back to sleep, and then this happened. So, you know, look, it, it paints a picture um, of a lot of just really difficult hand-wringing about, you know, well, what if this had gone differently? What if that had gone differently? Uh, but ultimately, all the evidence seems to point to this particular defendant. And uh, we're going to wait and see exactly what the jury gets to see tomorrow as far as these interrogations. You know, as you pointed out, does the suicide make him look guilty? Uh, I agree, it does. I can see why the state wants to get it in. Yeah, and I, and I think, you, you know, 
the jury needs all the information that they can get. I'm, I'm pro the jury having as much information and letting them decide, okay, this was relevant, this wasn't, this goes, you know, of course we have all these evidentiary, you know, um, codes that we need to follow as far as whether it's relevant, the defense, it's always the defense position when or something might be relevant, it's prejudicial to them because it would obviously be beneficial for them to exclude a potential suicide of the defendant because why is he killing himself if he didn't do anything? Um, you know, so, or why, why are we going to exclude the fact that the, um, that now he's giving us some information that the bodies might have been in some pit? If he didn't have anything to do with it, let's go, let's go to the pit. Let's figure out what's going on. Let's dig up the DNA evidence. So, you know, to some extent, um, you know, the prosecution's obviously going to push for this evidence. I believe that it should be admitted. The judge believes that it should be admitted. And hopefully the jury can have everything, every piece of evidence that they need because of the fact that the bodies are not here. And because we can't examine them, they need all the transcripts. They need the interrogation videos. They need to see that this particular defendant was not coerced in this particular situation and they, those statements that were made were genuine and they were truthful. Exactly. I want to shift gears a little bit now and talk about a case we're going to be covering uh, coming up hopefully at the end of this week here on the Law News Network and that's the Jeffrey Willis case out of Muskegon, Michigan. Now this just sort of ratchets up the level of horrificness because we've got a defendant he's accused of uh, abducting and killing one person Okay, and then uh, a little more than a year later, he's accused of killing yet another person. And uh, then there's a couple of years later, an abduction attempt. And finally, the police close in on this guy. Okay, and uh, the sequencing of the prosecutions is interesting because the first case that happened in 2013 seems to have some clearer cut evidence because the guy that says he helped this defendant, Jeffrey Willis, hide the body of the first victim, uh, basically confessed and said, I got called over. I saw the body. The defendant asked me to help hide it. We buried it. Here's where we buried it. The cell phone records match him up to the first case. The second case, the 2014 case, is a little more tricky for the state to prove, but that's the one that they're going on first here. The second case involves a woman, uh, you know, said to have been out jogging. Uh, she was found. The people who found her believe she may have been hit by a car. And once they look at the body, then they say, oh, no, wait a minute. No, she's been shot. And then time goes by. And eventually they catch this guy. And when they start looking at his computer, they see that he's got a file with her uh, that, that links him to her death. And then they test the bullets and they believe the bullets fired into this woman found by the side of the road uh, were fired by a gun that that defendant had. So you've got bullet uh, striation evidence and you've got this computer file. We don't know a lot more than that. and. It makes me wonder just exactly what the state has and is it enough to get a conviction? Because we know that some of these uh, bullets marks can uh, be taken apart in court. Uh, it's not an exact science. And there's a lot of literature out there that says, hey, this is not an exact science. So Orly, what do you make of this case out of Michigan? You know, in this situation, you're right. I do agree with the way that the events and how they decided to proceed uh, with these charges um, as a defense attorney, but looking at it from for a prosecution standpoint, I would think that they should go with their strongest point first, which is, you know, with the case, the murder where the accomplice is admitting uh, to all this evidence and to how the body was destroyed and, and what they did uh, in this situation, because I, I, I think that it would, if he did take the stand in that particular case, then that conviction would help as far as with their with their next case so strategically I agree with you we're not too sure about why they're going about it with this situation here yes we do have the bullet casings that match we do have 
a profile that links, which makes you know makes you question: Was he following this woman? How did he know her? You know, she apparently she was just she was some sort of therapist, I believe, that was just jogging, um, and this happened out of nowhere. Was he some sort of patient that was declined? You know, we don't know what the relationship between them is. And I'm very curious to know what it was about this particular woman um, that he was after, if that was the case. Well, part of me wonders, okay, so we, we've got uh, one death, then another death, and then an abduction attempt. And that's when police really started to zone in on this guy. And his MO in that uh, attempt was that he saw someone walking and then said, do you need to use my cell phone to make a call and in the process of doing that uh, tries to make off with that third person she gets away um, and that's where they really start to zero in on this guy so it makes me wonder if um, you know the mo in the um, this the second death here um, you know going up to somebody on the side of the road maybe she was jogging maybe he pulls up maybe he says you know something are you all right i don't know um but it it just kind of makes me wonder or was he just kind of randomly uh targeting yeah, a couple of these people because he wasn't randomly targeting one of the other victims who worked in a um in a convenience store and apparently he had been in and out of the store several times uh, a number of times so uh, that's a different case than the one he's going to be tried on uh, coming up this week they're still in the midst of jury selection but uh, the mo in the two murder cases is different but when you look at that abduction attempt you know you can you almost your brain wants to piece it together right. um and it makes me wonder you know there's that little wiggle room in the evidence rules that says if there's evidence of you know kind of like a common plan or opportunity is it possible that that aborted abduction attempt could come into this murder case it's really shaky evidence ground but it, I mean, there's a, a little tiny bit of wiggle room to, to try to do it. A lot of judges would say, no, I won't do it because it's too prejudicial. We try the cases separately. Right, right. But part of and, me and, wonders. Yeah, and in a situation like this where you have three victims as a defense, you know, as prosecution, you're going to say, okay, what is the MO here? Can we link them together? Was there any commonality? Was there a common plan, a scheme? why was it these individuals and not three other individuals and did he have a certain way of luring them in to him um, and and that would be very relevant because that goes you know part of this whole discussion of mo is to show that this is kind of the true identity of this defendant this defendant always has a certain way of doing something if they rob a bank they have a certain line that they use. They have a certain mask that they use whenever they go rob that bank. So it's kind of the same thing here. I think that we're trying to look at is, is there a commonality between these women? You know, uh, one wonders, um, because we were talking in the, uh, in the other room here at Law News in the newsroom earlier, and uh, one person uh, who was one of our previous guests just said, you know, look, this guy, um, not just a common criminal. This is somebody who is targeting people either who he barely knew or random people. Uh, so it, it just sounded that much scarier than some of the average cases that we've covered here. Yeah, it is. I mean, um, you know, most crimes are committed where the defendant actually knows the victim. You know, and then you could say, okay, heat of passion or in the situation with the Toledo case, you know, the, the affair, this, this whole um, affair disaster that led to her death. Um, and so you, it's not that you can ever justify because there's no justifiable reason for any of this, but you could see, okay, there's some sort of relationship between the defendant and the victim, and you're right. It is scary to think that there's people out there in the world that would just say, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, you're my next victim, so, um, you know, uh, I'm just going to come after you and, and, you know, hurt you and harm you, and, um, and look, there's a lot of sick people out there, and, and that's why we have different types of pleas, right, in the world, we have, we have not guilty, you could plead not guilty, you could plead guilty, you could plead not guilty by reason of insanity, um, 
we have these different types of pleas, and so you would uh, perhaps this person is an actual uh, psychopath. Maybe there's some kind of an evaluation that would possibly be done here. I'm sure maybe the defense would try to go for that if that's their angle in this case, because it doesn't make sense to just pick random uh, victims in the street and harm them. So, you know, I guess we'll have to wait and watch. Uh, exactly. Uh, I'm waiting to see exactly how the evidence is going to be presented here. Uh, but I keep going back to the trouble with the the uh, marks on a bullet as it leaves the chamber of a gun. We've had other cases here, like the Aaron Hernandez case, where that just, um, you know, there were other evidence issues there, but it wasn't enough. Um, there's a mountain of evidence that suggests that some of that some of those attempts to match a bullet up to a gun just is not reliable. It's not as foolproof as some other pieces of evidence. So, you know, I at this point really want to know what was found on his computer. So right. um, he, he has a file related to this person. Um, you know, he's not a journalist, so I, and he's not a police officer, so I'm not sure why he would. But right. but what's in that file, and is that enough? Is the file and is the bullet evidence enough to get a conviction in this case? One has to wonder, you know, is it going to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt? Right. And so, you know, and you're right. In these situations, when you have experts testify as to even ballistics or even cell phone tower evidence, whatever it may be, you know, defense likes to know. What's the chain of custody here when we're talking about ballistics? The casing, where did they go? How were they packaged? Who actually tested them? You know, was there a complete match? How do we know that it was a complete match? Maybe it could have been a, a gun that belonged to somebody else. So the ch what really matters in these types of cases when we're talking about ballistics and the circumstantial evidence is the chain of custody that was followed because that would prove the reliability of it. And sometimes there's evidence that's found at the crime scene that's just not enough to be tested. So we'll just have to see how it, you know, how it pans out. But I'm interested too as far as what he had in that folder that he created uh, for this for this individual. Yeah, well, we're hoping that uh, this case will start up uh, towards the end of this week. Jury selection is taking quite a, a lengthy amount of time from what we understand, especially the individual juror voir dire. It's a case that's gotten a lot of publicity in Michigan. So uh, they're really going through that jury with a fine tooth comb, trying to figure out if they can seat the uh, requisite number of 12 people to hear the case uh, dispassionately. So. Uh, we will keep everyone posted as to exactly where things stand on that case, but we expect it to be the next case we cover here on Law News. Orly Aroni, attorney out of Santa Monica, California, good to have you back here on Law News. We'll see you again soon, I hope. Have a good one. Thank okay. you. Okay. We're going to wrap up the broadcast day here. It's 5 o'clock, folks. And a reminder, as I always give you at this point, that we're on the air from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. Monday through Friday, unless testimony begins early or runs late, in which case we adjust the schedule accordingly so you don't miss anything with our gavel to gavel coverage. We are hoping that the Luis Toledo case out of Florida is going to be back tomorrow with more live testimony. We expect that it will be, and we expect that testimony to include more of the interrogation clips from the defendant. That's critical evidence at this point. So we hope to have that back for you live tomorrow. For now, this is Aaron Keller, and for all of us here at Law News, have a good evening.